at high water mark, and besides, had broke a hole in her bottom too big to be. Quickly stopped, and were set down musing what we should do, we heard the ship. Fire a gun, and make a waft with her ensign as a signal for the boat to come on. Board but no boat stirred, and they fired several times, making other signals for the boat. At last, when all their signals and firing proved fruitless, and they found the boat did not stir, we saw them, by the help of my glasses, hoist another boat out and row towards the shore, and we found, as they approached, that there were no less than ten men in her, and that they had firearms with them. As the ship lay almost two leagues from the shore, we had a full view of them. As they came, and a plain sight even of their faces, because the tide having set them a little to the east of the other boat, they rowed up under shore, to come to the same place where the other had landed, and where the boat lay, by. This means, I say, we had a full view of them, and the captain knew the persons and characters of all the men in the boat, of whom, he said, there were three very honest fellows, who, he was sure, were led into this conspiracy by the rest, being overpowered and frightened, but that as for the boatswain, who it seems was the chief officer among them, and all the rest, they were as outrageous as any of the ship's crew, and were no doubt made desperate in their new enterprise, and terribly apprehensive he was that they would be too powerful for us. I smiled at him, and told him that men in our circumstances were past the operation of fear, that seeing almost every condition that could be was better than that which we were supposed to be in, we ought to expect that the consequence, whether death or life, would be sure to be a deliverance. I asked him what he thought of the circumstances of my life, and whether a deliverance were not worth venturing for? And where, sir, said I, is your belief of my being preserved here on purpose to save your life? Which elevated you a little while ago. For my part, said I, there seems to be but one thing amiss in all the prospect of it. What is that, say he? Why, said I, it is, that as you say there are three or four honest fellows among them which should be spared. Had they been all of the wicked part of the crew I should have thought. God's providence had singled them out to deliver them into your hands. For depend upon it, every man that comes ashore is our own, and shall die or live as they behave to us. As I spoke this with a raised voice and cheerful countenance, I found it greatly encouraged him, so we set vigorously to our business. We had, upon the first appearance of the boats coming from the ship, considered of separating our prisoners, and we had, indeed, secured them. Effectually. Two of them, of whom the captain was less assured than ordinary, I sent with Friday, and one of the three delivered men, to my cave, where they were remote enough, and out of danger of being heard or discovered, or of finding their way out of the woods if they could have delivered themselves. Here they left them bound, but gave them provisions, and promised them, if they continued there quietly, to give them their liberty in a day or two, but that if they attempted their escape they should be put to death without mercy. They promised faithfully to bear their confinement with patience, and were very thankful that they had such good usage as to have provisions and light left them, for Friday gave them candles, such as we made ourselves, for their comfort, and they did not know but that he stood sentinel over them at the entrance. The other prisoners had better usage, two of them were kept peeny wand, indeed, because the captain was not able to trust them, but the other two were taken into my service, upon the captain's recommendation, and upon their solemnly engaging to live and die with us, so with them and the three honest men we were seven men, well armed, and I made no doubt we should be able to deal well enough with the ten that were coming, considering that the captain 
had said there were three or four honest men among them also. As soon as they got to the place where their other boat lay, they ran their boat into the beach and came all on shore, hauling the boat up after them, which I was glad to see. For I was afraid they would rather have left the boat at an anchor some distance from the shore, with some hands in her to guard her, and so we should not be able to seize the boat. Being on shore, the first thing they did, they ran all to their other boat, and it was easy to see they were under a great surprise to find her stripped, as above, of all that was in her, and a great hole in her bottom. After they had mused a while upon this, they set up two or three great shouts, hallooing with all their might, to try if they could make their companions here, but all was to no purpose. Then they came all close in a ring, and fired a volley of their small arms, which indeed we heard, and the echoes made the woods ring. But it was all one, those in the cave, we were sure, could not hear, and those in our keeping, though they heard it well enough, yet durst give no answer to them. They were so astonished at the surprise of this, that, as they told us afterwards, they resolved to go all on board again to their ship, and let them know that the men were all murdered. And the longboat staved, accordingly, they immediately launched their boat again, and got all of them on board. The captain was terribly amazed, and even confounded, at this, believing they would go on board the ship again and set sail, giving their comrades over for lost, and so he should still lose the ship, which he was in hopes we should have recovered, but he was quickly as much frightened the other way. They had not been long put off with the boat, when we perceived them all coming on shore again, but with this new measure in their conduct, which it seems they consulted together upon, viz. to leave three men in the boat, and the rest to go on shore, and go up into the country to look for their fellows. This was a great disappointment to us, for now we were at a loss what to do, as our seizing those seven men on shore would be no advantage to us if we let the boat escape, because they would row away to the ship, and then the rest of them would be sure to weigh and set sail, and so our recovering the ship would be lost. However we had no remedy but to wait and see what the issue of things might present. The seven men came on shore, and the three who remained in the boat put her off to a good distance from the shore, and came to an anchor to wait for them, so that it was impossible for us to come at them in the boat. Those that came on shore kept close together, marching towards the top of the little hill under which my habitation lay, and we could see them plainly. Though they could not perceive us, we should have been very glad if they would have come nearer us, so that we might have fired at them, or that they would have gone farther off, that we might come abroad. But when they were come to the brow of the hill where they could see a great way into the valleys and woods, which lay towards the northeast part, and where the island lay lowest. They shouted and hallooed till they were weary, and not caring, it seems, to venture far from the shore, nor far from one another, they sat down together under a tree to consider it. Had they thought fit to have gone to sleep there, as the other part of them had done, they had done the job for us, but they were too full of apprehensions of danger to venture to go to sleep, though they could not tell what the danger was they had to fear. The captain made a very just proposal to me upon this consultation of theirs, viz. that perhaps they would all fire a volley again, to endeavor to make their fellows hear, and that we should all sally upon them just at the juncture, when their pieces were all discharged, and they would certainly yield, and we should have them without bloodshed. I liked this proposal, provided it was done. While we were near enough to come up to them before they could load their pieces again. But this event did not happen, and we lay still a long time, very irresolute what course to take. 
At length I told them there would be nothing done, in my opinion, till night, and then, if they did not return to the boat. Perhaps we might find a way to get between them and the shore, and so might use some stratagem with them in the boat to get them on shore. We waited a great while, though very impatient for their removing, and were very uneasy when, after long consultation, we saw them all start up and march down towards the sea, it seems they had such dreadful apprehensions of the danger of the place, that they resolved to go on board the ship again, give their companions over, for lost, and so go on with their intended voyage with the ship. As soon as I perceived them go towards the shore, I imagined it to be as it really was that they had given over their search, and were going back again. And the captain, as soon as I told him my thoughts, was ready to sink at the apprehensions of it, but I presently thought of a stratagem to fetch them back again, and which answered my end to a tittle. I ordered Friday and the captain's mate to go over the little creek westward, towards the place where the savages came on shore, when Friday was rescued, and so soon as they came to a little rising round, at about half a mile distant, I bid them halloo out, as loud as they could, and wait till they found the seamen heard them. That as soon as ever they heard the seamen answer them, they should return it. Again, and then, keeping out of sight, take a round, always answering when the others hallooed, to draw them as far into the island and among the woods as possible, and then will about again to me by such ways as I directed them. They were just going into the boat when Friday and the mate hallooed, and they presently heard them, and answering, ran along the shore westward, towards the voice they heard, when they were stopped by the creek, where the water being up, they could not get over, and called for the boat to come up and set them over, as, indeed, I expected. When they had set themselves over, I observed that the boat being gone a good way into the creek, and, as it were, in a harbor within the land, they took one of the three men out of her, to go along with them, and left only two in the boat, having fastened her to the stump of a little tree on the shore. This was what I wished for, and immediately leaving. Friday and the captain's mate to their business, I took the rest with me. And, crossing the creek out of their sight, we surprised the two men before. They were aware one of them lying on the shore, and the other being in the boat. The fellow on shore was between sleeping and waking, and going to start up, the captain, who was foremost, ran in upon him, and knocked him down and then called out to him in the boat to yield, or he was a dead man. They needed very few arguments to persuade a single man to yield, when he saw five men upon him and his comrade knocked down, besides, this was, it seems, one of the three who were not so hardy in the mutiny as the rest of the crew, and therefore was easily persuaded not only to yield, but afterwards to join very sincerely with us. In the meantime, Friday and the captain's mate so well managed their business with the rest that they drew them, by hallooing and answering, from one hill to another, and from one wood to another, till they not only heartily tired them, but left them where they were, very sure they could not reach back to the boat before it was dark, and, indeed, they were heartily tired themselves also, by the time they came back to us. We had nothing now to do but to watch for them in the dark, and to fall upon them, so as to make sure work with them. It was several hours after Friday came back to me before they came back to their boat, and we could hear the foremost of them, long before they came quite up, calling to those behind to come along, and could also hear them answer, and complain how lame and tired they were, and not able to come any faster, which was very welcome news to us. At length they came up to the boat, but it is impossible to express their confusion when they found the boat fast aground in the creek, 
the tide ebbed out, and their two men. Gone. We could hear them call one to another in a most lamentable manner. Telling one another they were got into an enchanted island, that either there were inhabitants in it, and they should all be murdered, or else there were devils and spirits in it, and they should be all carried away and devoured. They hallooed again, and called their two comrades by their names a great many times, but no answer. After some time we could see them, by the little light. There was, run about, wringing their hands like men in despair, and sometimes they would go and sit down in the boat to rest themselves, then come ashore again, and walk about again, and so the same thing over again. My men would fain have had me give them leave to fall upon them at once in the dark, but I was willing to take them at some advantage, so as to spare them, and kill as few of them as I could, and especially I was unwilling to hazard the killing of any of our men, knowing the others were very well armed. I resolved to wait, to see if they did not separate, and therefore, to make sure of them, I drew my ambuscade nearer, and ordered Friday and the captain to creep upon their hands and feet, as close to the ground as they could, that they might not be discovered, and get as near them as they could possibly before they offered to fire. They had not been long in that posture when the boatswain, who was the principal ringleader of the mutiny, and had now shown himself the most dejected and dispirited of all the rest, came walking towards them, with two more of the crew, the captain was so eager at having this principal rogue so much in his power, that he could hardly have patience to let him come so near as to be sure of him, for they only heard his tongue before, but when they came nearer, the captain and Friday, starting up on their feet, let fly at them. The boatswain was killed upon the spot, the next man was shot in the body, and fell just by him, though he did not die till an hour or two after, and the third ran for it. At the noise of the fire I immediately advanced with my whole army, which was now eight men, viz. Myself, Generalissimo, Friday, my lieutenant general, the captain and his two men, and the three prisoners of war whom we had trusted with arms. We came upon them, indeed, in the dark, so that they could not see our number, and I made the man they had left in the boat, who was now one of us, to call them by name, to try if I could bring them to a parley, and so perhaps might reduce them to terms, which fell out just as we desired, for indeed it was easy to think, as their condition then was, they would be very willing to capitulate. So he calls out as loud as he could to one of them. Tom Smith. Tom Smith. Tom Smith answered immediately, is that Robinson, for it seems he knew the voice. The other answered, I, I, for God's sake, Tom Smith, throw down your arms and yield. Or you are all dead men this moment. Who must we yield to? Where? Are they, says Smith again. Here they are, says he. Here's our captain and fifty men with him, have been hunting you. These two hours, the boatswain is killed, Will Fry is wounded, and I am a prisoner, and if you do not yield you are all lost. Will they give us quarter, then, says Tom Smith, and we will yield. I'll go and ask, if you promise to yield, said Robinson, so. He asked the captain, and the captain himself then calls out, you. Smith, you know my voice, if you lay down your arms immediately and submit, you. Shall have your lives, all but Will Atkins. Upon this Will Atkins cried out, for God's sake, Captain, give me. Quarter, what have I done? They have all been as bad as I which, by the way, was not true, for it seems this Will Atkins was the first man that laid hold of the captain when they first mutinied, and used him barbarously in tying his hands and giving him injurious language. 
however, the captain told him he must lay down his arms at discretion, and trust to the governor's mercy. By which he meant me, for they all called me governor. In a word, they all laid down their arms and begged their lives, and I sent the man that had parleyed with them, and two more, who bound them all, and then my great army of fifty men, which, with those three, were in all but eight, came up and seized upon them, and upon their boat, only that I kept myself and one more out of sight. For reasons of state. Our next work was to repair the boat, and think of seizing the ship, and as for the captain, now he had leisure to parley with them, he expostulated with them. Upon the villainy of their practices with him, and upon the further wickedness of their design, and how certainly it must bring them to misery and distress in the end, and perhaps to the gallows. They all appeared very penitent, and begged hard for their lives. As for that, he told them they were not his prisoners, but the commanders of the island, that they thought they had set him on shore in a barren, uninhabited island, but it had pleased God so to direct them that it was inhabited, and that the governor was an Englishman. That he might hang them all there, if he pleased, but as he had given them all quarter, he supposed he would send them to England, to be dealt with there as justice required, except Atkins, whom he was commanded by the governor to advise to prepare for death, for that he would be hanged in the morning. Though this was all but a fiction of his own, yet it had its desired effect. Atkins fell upon his knees to beg the captain to intercede with the governor for his life, and all the rest begged of him, for God's sake, that they might not be sent to England. It now occurred to me that the time of our deliverance was come, and that it would be a most easy thing to bring these fellows in to be hardy in getting possession of the ship, so I retired in the dark from them, that they might not see what kind of a governor they had, and called the captain to me, when I called, at a good distance, one of the men was ordered to speak again, and say to the captain, Captain, the commander calls for you, and presently the captain replied, Tell His Excellency I am just coming. This more perfectly amazed them, and they all believed that the commander was just by, with his fifty men. Upon the captain coming to me, I told him my project for seizing the ship, which he liked wonderfully well, and resolved to put it in execution the next morning. But, in order to execute it with more art, and to be secure of success, I told him we must divide the prisoners, and that he should go and take Atkins, and two more of the worst of them, and send them peeny one to the cave where the others lay. This was committed to Friday and the two men who came on shore with the captain. They conveyed them to the cave as to a prison, and it was, indeed, a dismal place. Especially to men in their condition. The others I ordered to my bower, as I called it, of which I have given a full description, and as it was fenced in. And they peeny wand, the place was secure enough, considering they were upon their behavior. To these in the morning I sent the captain, who was to enter into a parley with them, in a word, to try them, and tell me whether he thought they might be trusted or not to go on board and surprise the ship. He talked to them of the injury done him, of the condition they were brought to, and that though the governor had given them quarter for their lives as to the present action, yet that if they were sent to England they would all be hanged in chains, but that if they would join in so just an attempt as to recover the ship, he would have the governor's engagement for their pardon. Anyone may guess how readily such a proposal would be accepted by men in there condition, they fell down on their knees to the captain, and promised, with the deepest imprecations, that they would be faithful to him to the last drop, and that they should owe their lives to him, and would go with him all over the world, 
that they would own him as a father to them as long as they lived. Well, says the captain, I must go and tell the governor. What you say, and see what I can do to bring him to consent to it. So he brought me an account of the temper he found them in, and that he verily believed they would be faithful. However, that we might be very secure, I told him he should go back again and choose out those five, and tell them, that they might see he did not want men, that he would take out those five to be his assistants, and that the governor would keep the other two, and the three that were sent prisoners to the castle, my cave, as hostages for the fidelity of those five, and that if they proved unfaithful in the execution, the five hostages should be hanged in chains alive on the shore. This looked severe, and convinced them that the governor was in earnest, however, they had no way left them but to accept it, and it was now the business of the prisoners, as much as of the captain, to persuade the other five to do their duty. Our strength was now thus ordered for the expedition, first, the captain, his mate, and passenger, second, the two prisoners of the first gang, to whom, having their character from the captain, I had given their liberty, and trusted them with arms, third, the other two that I had kept till now in my bower. Peeny wand, but on the captain's motion had now released, fourth, these five released at last, so that there were twelve in all, besides five we kept prisoners in the cave for hostages. I asked the captain if he was willing to venture with these hands on board the ship, but as for me and my man Friday, I did not think it was proper for us to stir, having seven men left behind, and it was employment enough for us to keep them asunder, and supply them with victuals. As to the five in the cave, I resolved to keep them fast, but Friday went in twice a day to them, to supply them with necessaries, and I made the other two carry provisions to a certain distance, where Friday was to take them. When I showed myself to the two hostages, it was with the captain, who told them I was the person the governor had ordered to look after them, and that it was the governor's pleasure they should not stir anywhere but by my direction, that if they did, they would be fetched into the castle, and be laid in irons, so that as we never suffered them to see me as governor, I now appeared as another person, and spoke of the governor, the garrison, the castle, and the like, upon all occasions. The captain now had no difficulty before him, but to furnish his two boats, stop the breach of one, and man them. He made his passenger captain of one, with four of the men, and himself, his mate, and five more, went in the other. And they contrived their business very well, for they came up to the ship about midnight. As soon as they came within call of the ship, he made Robinson hail them, and tell them they had brought off the men and the boat, but that it was a long time before they had found them, and the like, holding them in a chat. Till they came to the ship's side, when the captain and the mate entering, first with their arms, immediately knocked down the second mate and carpenter, with the butt end of their muskets, being very faithfully seconded by their men, they secured all the rest that were upon the main and quarter decks, and began to fasten the hatches, to keep them down that were below, when the other boat and their men, entering at the four chains, secured the forecastle of the ship, and the scuttle which went down into the cook room, making three men they found their prisoners. When this was done, and all safe upon deck, the captain ordered the mate, with three men, to break into the roundhouse, where the new rebel captain lay, who, having taken the alarm, had got up, and with two men, and a boy had got firearms in their hands, and when the mate, with a crow, split open the door, the new captain and his men fired boldly among them, and wounded the mate with a musket ball, which broke his arm, and wounded two more. 
of the men, but killed nobody. The mate, calling for help, rushed, however, into the roundhouse, wounded as he was, and, with his pistol, shot the new captain through the head, the bullet entering at his mouth, and came out again behind one of his ears, so that he never spoke a word more, upon which the rest yielded, and the ship was taken effectually, without any more lives lost. As soon as the ship was thus secured, the captain ordered seven guns to be fired, which was the signal agreed upon with me to give me notice of his success, which, you may be sure, I was very glad to hear, having sat watching upon the shore for it till near two o'clock in the morning. Having thus heard the signal plainly, I laid me down, and it having been a day of great fatigue to me, I slept very sound, till I was surprised with the noise of a gun, and presently starting up, I heard a man call me by the name of Governor. Governor, and presently I knew the captain's voice, when, climbing up to the top of the hill, there he stood, and, pointing to the ship, he embraced me in his arms, my dear friend and deliverer, says he, there's your ship, for she is all yours, and so are we, and all that belong to her. I cast my eyes to the ship, and there she rode, within little more than half a mile of the shore, for they had weighed her anchor as soon as they were masters of her, and, the weather being fair, had brought her to an anchor just against the mouth of the little creek, and the tide being up, the captain had brought the pinnace in near the place where I had first landed my rafts, and so landed just at my door. I was at first ready to sink down with the surprise, for I saw my deliverance, indeed, visibly put into my hands, all things easy, and a large ship just ready to carry me away whither I pleased to go. At first, for some time, I was not able to answer him one word, but as he had taken me in his arms, I held fast by him, or I should have fallen to the ground. He perceived the surprise, and immediately pulled a bottle out of his pocket and gave me a dram of cordial, which he had brought on purpose for me. After I had drunk it, I sat down upon the ground, and though it brought me to myself, yet it was a good while before I could speak a word to him. All this time the poor man was in as great an ecstasy as I, only not under any surprise as I was, and he said a thousand kind and tender things to me, to compose and bring me to myself, but such was the flood of joy in my breast, that it put all my spirits into confusion, at last it broke out into tears, and in a little while after I recovered my speech, I then took my turn, and embraced him as my deliverer, and we rejoiced together. I told him I looked upon him as a man sent by heaven to deliver me, and that the whole transaction seemed to be a chain of wonders that such things as these were the testimonies we had of a secret hand of providence governing the world, and an evidence that the eye of an infinite power could search into the remotest corner of the world, and send help to the miserable whenever he pleased. I forgot not to lift up my heart in thankfulness to heaven, and what heart could forbear to bless him, who had not only in a miraculous manner provided for me in such a wilderness, and in such a desolate condition, but from whom every deliverance must always be acknowledged to proceed. When we had talked a while, the captain told me he had brought me some little refreshment, such as the ship afforded, and such as the wretches that had been. So long his masters had not plundered him of. Upon this, he called aloud to the boat, and bade his men bring the things ashore that were for the governor and, indeed, it was a present as if I had been one that was not to be carried away with them, but as if I had been to dwell upon the island still. First, he had brought me a case of bottles full of excellent cordial waters, six large 
bottles of Madeira wine, the bottles held two quarts each, two pounds of excellent good tobacco, twelve good pieces of the ship's beef, and six pieces of pork, with a bag of peas, and about a hundred weight of biscuit, he also brought me a box of sugar, a box of flour, a bag full of lemons, and two bottles of lime juice, and abundance of other things. But besides these, and what was a thousand times more useful to me, he brought me six new clean shirts, six very good neck cloths, two pair of gloves, one pair of shoes, a hat, and one pair of stockings, with a very good suit of clothes of his own, which had been worn but very little, in a word, he clothed me from head to foot. It was a very kind and agreeable present, as any one may imagine, to one in my circumstances, but never was anything in the world of that kind so unpleasant, awkward, and uneasy as it was to me to wear such clothes at first. After these ceremonies were passed, and after all his good things were brought into my little apartment, we began to consult what was to be done with the prisoners we had, for it was worth considering whether we might venture to take them with us or no, especially two of them, whom he knew to be incorrigible and refractory to the last degree, and the captain said he knew they were such rogues that there was no obliging them, and if he did carry them away, it must be in irons, as malefactors, to be delivered over to justice at the first English colony he could come to, and I found that the captain himself was very anxious about it. Upon this, I told him that, if he desired it, I would undertake to bring the two men he spoke of to make it their own request that he should leave them upon the island. I should be very glad of that, says the captain, with all my heart. Well, says I, I will send for them up and talk with them for you. So I caused Friday and the two hostages, for they were now discharged, their comrades. Having performed their promise, I say, I caused them to go to the cave, and bring up the five men, peeny one as they were, to the bower, and keep them there. Till I came. After some time, I came thither dressed in my new habit, and now I was called governor again. Being all met, and the captain with me, I caused the men to be brought before me, and I told them I had got a full account of their villainous behavior to the captain, and how they had run away with the ship, and were preparing to commit further robberies, but that Providence had ensnared them in their own ways, and that they were fallen into the pit which they had dug for others. I let them know that by my direction the ship had been seized, that she lay now in the road, and they might see by and by that their new captain had received the reward of his villainy, and that they would see him hanging at the yard arm, that, as to them, I wanted to know what they had to say why I should not execute them as pirates taken in the fact, as by my commission they could not doubt but I had authority so to do. One of them answered in the name of the rest, that they had nothing to say but this, that when they were taken the captain promised them their lives, and they humbly implored my mercy. But I told them I knew not what mercy to show them. For as for myself, I had resolved to quit the island with all my men, and had taken passage with the captain to go to England, and as for the captain, he could not carry them to England other than as prisoners in irons, to be tried for mutiny and running away with the ship, the consequence of which, they must needs know, would be the gallows, so that I could not tell what was best for them, unless they had a mind to take their fate in the island. If they desired that, as I had liberty to leave the island, I had some inclination to give them their lives, if they thought they could shift on shore. They seemed very thankful for it, and said they would much rather venture to stay there than be carried to England to be hanged. So I left it on that issue. However, the captain seemed to make some difficulty of it, 
as if he durst not leave them there. Upon this I seemed a little angry with the captain, and told him that they were my prisoners, not his, and that seeing I had offered them so much favor, I would be as good as my word, and that if he did not think fit to consent to it I would set them at liberty, as I found them, and if he did not like it he might take them again if he could catch them. Upon this they appeared very thankful, and I accordingly set them at liberty, and bade them retire into the woods, to the place whence they came, and I would leave them some firearms, some ammunition, and some directions how they should live very well if they thought fit. Upon this I prepared to go on board the ship, but told the captain I would stay that night to prepare my things, and desired him to go on board in the meantime, and keep all right in the ship, and send the boat on shore next day for me, ordering him, at all events, to cause the new captain, who was killed, to be hanged at the yard arm, that these men might see him. When the captain was gone I sent for the men up to me to my apartment, and entered seriously into discourse with them on their circumstances. I told them. I thought they had made a right choice, that if the captain had carried them away they would certainly be hanged. I showed them the new captain hanging at the yard arm of the ship, and told them they had nothing less to expect. When they had all declared their willingness to stay, I then told them I would let them into the story of my living there, and put them into the way of making it easy to them. Accordingly, I gave them the whole history of the place, and of my coming to it, showed them my fortifications, the way I made my bread, planted my corn, cured my grapes, and, in a word, all that was necessary to make them easy. I told them the story also of the seventeen Spaniards that were to be expected, for whom I left a letter, and made them promise to treat them in common with themselves. Here it may be noted that the captain, who had ink on board, was greatly surprised that I never hit upon a way of making ink of charcoal and water, or of something else, as I had done things much more difficult. I left them my firearms viz. Five muskets, three fowling pieces, and three swords. I had above a barrel and a half of powder left, for after the first year or two I used but little, and wasted none. I gave them a description of the way I managed the goats, and directions to milk and fatten them, and to make both butter and cheese. In a word, I gave them every part of my own story, and told them I should prevail with the captain to leave them two barrels of gunpowder more, and some garden seeds, which I told them I would have been very glad of. Also, I gave them the bag of peas which the captain had brought me to eat, and bade them be sure to sow and increase them. Chapter 19 Return to England Having done all this I left them the next day, and went on board the ship. We prepared immediately to sail, but did not weigh that night. The next morning, early, two of the five men came swimming to the ship's side, and making the most lamentable complaint of the other three, begged to be taken into the ship for God's sake, for they should be murdered, and begged the captain to take them on board, though he hanged them immediately. Upon this the captain pretended to have no power without me, but after some difficulty, and after their solemn promises of amendment, they were taken on board, and were, some time after, soundly whipped and pickled, after which they proved very honest and quiet fellows. Some time after this, the boat was ordered on shore, the tide being up, with the things promised to the men, to which the captain, at my intercession, caused their chests and clothes to be added, which they took, and were very thankful for. I also encouraged them, by telling them that if it lay in my power to send any vessel to take them in, I would not forget them. When I took leave of this island, 
I carried on board, for relics, the great goat skin cap I had made, my umbrella, and one of my parrots, also, I forgot. Not to take the money I formerly mentioned, which had lain by me so long. Useless that it was grown rusty or tarnished, and could hardly pass for silver. Till it had been a little rubbed and handled, as also the money I found in the wreck of the Spanish ship. And thus I left the island, the 19th of December, as I found by the ship's account, in the year 1686, after I had been upon it. Eight and twenty years, two months, and nineteen days, being delivered from this second captivity the same day of the month that I first made my escape in the longboat from among the moors of Sally. In this vessel, after a long voyage, I arrived in England the 11th of June, in the year 1687, having been 35 years absent. When I came to England I was as perfect a stranger to all the world as if I had never been known there. My benefactor and faithful steward, whom I had left my money in trust with, was alive, but had had great misfortunes in the world, was become a widow the second time, and very low in the world. I made her very easy. As to what she owed me, assuring her I would give her no trouble, but, on the contrary, in gratitude for her former care and faithfulness to me, I relieved her as my little stock would afford, which at that time would, indeed, allow me to do but little for her, but I assured her I would never forget her former kindness to me, nor did I forget her when I had sufficient to help her, as shall be observed in its proper place. I went down afterwards into Yorkshire. But my father was dead, and my mother and all the family extinct, except that I found two sisters, and two of the children of one of my brothers, and as I had been long ago given over for dead, there had been no provision made for me, so that, in a word, I found nothing to relieve or assist me, and that the little money I had would not do much for me as to settling in the world. I met with one piece of gratitude indeed, which I did not expect, and this was that the master of the ship, whom I had so happily delivered, and by the same means saved the ship and cargo, having given a very handsome account to the owners of the manor how I had saved the lives of the men and the ship, they invited me to meet them and some other merchants concerned, and all together made me a very handsome compliment upon the subject, and a present of almost two hundred pounds sterling. But after making several reflections upon the circumstances of my life, and how little way this would go towards settling me in the world, I resolved to go to Lisbon, and see if I might not come at some information of the state of my plantation in the Brazils, and of what was become of my partner, who, I had reason to suppose, had some years past given me over for dead. With this view I took shipping for Lisbon, where I arrived in April following, my man Friday, accompanying me very honestly in all these ramblings, and proving a most faithful servant upon all occasions. When I came to Lisbon, I found out, by inquiry, and to my particular satisfaction, my old friend, the captain of the ship who first took me up at sea off the shore of Africa. He was now grown old and had left off going to sea, having put his son, who was far from a young man, into his ship, and who still used the Brazil trade. The old man did not know me, and indeed I hardly knew him. But I soon brought him to my remembrance, and as soon brought myself to his remembrance, when I told him who I was. After some passionate expressions of the old acquaintance between us, I inquired, you may be sure, after my plantation and my partner. The old man told me he had not been in the Brazils for about nine years, but that he could assure me that when he came away my partner was living, but the trustees whom I 
had joined with him to take cognizance of my part were both dead, that. However, he believed I would have a very good account of the improvement of the plantation, for that, upon the general belief of my being cast away and drowned, my trustees had given in the account of the produce of my part of the plantation to the procurator fiscal, who had appropriated it, in case I never came to claim it, one-third to the king, and two-thirds to the monastery of St. Augustine, to be expended for the benefit of the poor, and for the conversion of the Indians to the Catholic faith, but that, if I appeared, or any one for me, to claim the inheritance, it would be restored, only that the improvement or annual production, being distributed to charitable uses, could not be restored, but he assured me that the steward of the king's revenue from lands, and the providory, or steward of the monastery, had taken great care all along that the incumbent, that is to say my partner, gave every year a faithful account of the produce, of which they had duly received my moiety. I asked him if he knew to what height of improvement he had brought the plantation, and whether he thought it might be worth looking after, or whether, on my going thither, I should meet with any obstruction to my possessing my just right in the moiety. He told me he could not tell exactly to what degree the plantation was improved, but this he knew, that my partner was grown exceeding rich upon the enjoying his part of it, and that, to the best of his remembrance, he had heard that the king's third of my part, which was, it seems, granted away to some other monastery or religious house, amounted to above two hundred moidores a year, that as to my being restored to a quiet possession of it. There was no question to be made of that, my partner being alive to witness my title, and my name being also enrolled in the register of the country, also he told me that the survivors of my two trustees were very fair, honest people, and very wealthy, and he believed I would not only have their assistance for putting me in possession, but would find a very considerable sum of money in their hands for my account, being the produce of the farm while their fathers held the trust, and before it was given up, as above, which, as he remembered, was for about twelve years. I showed myself a little concerned and uneasy at this account, and inquired of the old captain how it came to pass that the trustees should thus dispose of my effects, when he knew that I had made my will, and had made him, the Portuguese captain, my universal heir, and see. He told me that was true, but that as there was no proof of my being dead, he could not act as executor until some certain account should come of my death. And, besides, he was not willing to intermeddle with a thing so remote, that it was true he had registered my will, and put in his claim, and could he have given any account of my being dead or alive, he would have acted by procuration and taken possession of the ingenio, so they call the sugar house, and have given his son, who was now at the Brazils, orders to do it. But, says the old man, I have one piece of news to tell you, which perhaps may not be so acceptable to you as the rest, and that is, believing you were lost, and all the world believing so also, your partner and trustees did offer to account with me, in your name, for the first six or eight years profits, which I received. There being at that time great disbursements for increasing the works, building an ingenio, and buying slaves. It did not amount to near so much as afterwards it produced, however. Says the old man, I shall give you a true account of what I have received in all, and how I have disposed of it. After a few days further conference with this ancient friend, he brought me an account of the first six years income of my plantation, signed by my partner and the merchant trustees, being always delivered in goods, viz. tobacco in roll, and sugar in chests, besides rum, molasses, 
and C, which is the consequence of a sugar work, and I found by this account, that every year the income considerably increased, but, as above, the disbursements being large, the sum at first was small, however, the old man let me see that he was debtor to me 470 moidores of gold, besides 60 chests of sugar and 15 double rolls of tobacco, which were lost in his ship, he, having been shipwrecked coming home to Lisbon, about 11 years after my having the place. The good man then began to complain of his misfortunes, and how he had been obliged to make use of my money to recover his losses, and buy him a share in a new ship. However, my old friend, says he, you shall not want a supply in your necessity, and as soon as my son returns you shall be fully satisfied. Upon this he pulls out an old pouch, and gives me 160 Portugal moidores in gold, and giving the writings of his title to the ship, which his son was gone to the Brazils, in, of which he was quarter part owner, and his son another, he puts them both into my hands for security of the rest. I was too much moved with the honesty and kindness of the poor man to be able to bear this, and remembering what he had done for me, how he had taken me up at sea, and how generously he had used me on all occasions, and particularly how sincere a friend he was now to me, I could hardly refrain weeping at what he had said to me, therefore I asked him if his circumstances admitted him to spare so much money at that time, and if it would not straighten him. He told me. He could not say but it might straighten him a little, but, however, it was my money, and I might want it more than he. Everything the good man said was full of affection, and I could hardly refrain from tears while he spoke, in short, I took one hundred of the moidores, and called for a pen and ink to give him a receipt for them, then I returned him the rest, and told him if ever I had possession of the plantation I would return the other to him also, as, indeed, I afterwards did, and that as to the bill of sale of his part in his son's ship, I would not take it by any means, but that if I wanted the money, I found he was honest enough to pay me. And if I did not, but came to receive what he gave me reason to expect, I would never have a penny more from him. When this was passed, the old man asked me if he should put me into a method to make my claim to my plantation. I told him I thought to go over to it myself. He said I might do so if I pleased, but that if I did not, there were ways enough to secure my right, and immediately to appropriate the profits to my use, and as there were ships in the river of Lisbon just ready to go away to Brazil, he made me enter my name in a public register, with his affidavit, affirming, upon oath, that I was alive, and that I was the same person who took up the land for the planting the said plantation at first. This being regularly attested by a notary, and a procuration affixed, he directed me to send it, with a letter of his writing, to a merchant of his acquaintance at the place and then proposed my staying with him till an account came of the return. Never was anything more honorable than the proceedings upon this procuration. For in less than seven months I received a large packet from the survivors of my trustees, the merchants, for whose account I went to see, in which were the following, particular letters and papers enclosed. First, there was the account current of the produce of my farm or plantation from the year when their fathers had balanced with my old Portugal captain. Being for six years, the balance appeared to be 1,174 moidores in my favor. Secondly, there was the account of four years more, while they kept the effects in their hands, before the government claimed the administration, as being the effects of a person not to be found, which they called civil death, and the balance of this, the value of the plantation increasing, amounted to 19. 
1446 crusadus, being about 3,240 moidores. Thirdly, there was the prior of St. Augustine's account, who had received the prophets for above 14 years, but not being able to account for what was disposed of by the hospital, very honestly declared he had 800 and 72 moidores not distributed, which he acknowledged to my account. As to the king's part, that refunded nothing. There was a letter of my partners, congratulating me very affectionately. Upon my being alive, giving me an account how the estate was improved, and what. It produced a year, with the particulars of the number of squares, or acres. That it contained, how planted, how many slaves there were upon it, and making two and twenty crosses for blessings, told me he had said so many Ave. Marias to thank the Blessed Virgin that I was alive, inviting me very passionately to come over and take possession of my own, and in the meantime to give him orders to whom he should deliver my effects if I did not come myself. Concluding with a hearty tender of his friendship, and that of his family, and sent me as a present seven fine leopard skins, which he had, it seems, received from Africa, by some other ship that he had sent thither, and which, it seems, had made a better voyage than I. He sent me also five chests of excellent sweetmeats, and a hundred pieces of gold uncoined, not quite so large as Moidores. By the same fleet my two merchant trustees shipped me one thousand. 200 chests of sugar, 800 rolls of tobacco, and the rest of the whole account in gold. I might well say now, indeed, that the latter end of job was better than the beginning. It is impossible to express the flutterings of my very heart when I found all my wealth about me, for as the Brazil ships come all in fleets, the same ships which brought my letters brought my goods, and the effects were safe in the river before the letters came to my hand. In a word, I turned pale, and grew sick, and, had not the old man run and fetched me a cordial, I believe the sudden surprise of joy had overset nature, and I had died upon the spot, nay. After that I continued very ill, and was so some hours, till a physician being sent for, and something of the real cause of my illness being known, he ordered me to be let blood, after which I had relief, and grew well, but I verily believe, if I had not been eased by event given in that manner to the spirits, I should have died. I was now master, all on a sudden, of above five thousand pounds sterling in money, and had an estate, as I might well call it, in the Brazils, of above a thousand pounds a year, as sure as an estate of lands in England and, in a word, I was in a condition which I scarce knew how to understand, or how to compose myself for the enjoyment of it. The first thing I did was to recompense my original benefactor, my good old captain, who had been first charitable to me in my distress, kind to me in my beginning, and honest to me at the end. I showed him all that was sent to me, I told him that, next to the providence of heaven, which disposed all things, it was owing to him, and that it now lay on me to reward him, which I would do a hundredfold, so I first returned to him the hundred moidores I had received of him, then I sent for a notary, and caused him to draw up a general release or discharge from the four hundred and seventy moidores, which he had acknowledged he owed me, in the fullest end firmest manner possible. After which I caused a procuration to be drawn, empowering him to be the receiver of the annual profits of my plantation, and appointing my partner to account with him, and make the returns, by the usual fleets, to him in my name, and by a clause in the end, made a grant of one hundred moidores a year to him during his life, out of the effects, and fifty moidores a year to his son after him, for his life, and thus I requited my old man. 
I had now to consider which way to steer my course next, and what to do with. The estate that Providence had thus put into my hands, and, indeed, I had more care upon my head now than I had in my state of life in the island where I wanted nothing but what I had, and had nothing but what I wanted, whereas I had now a great charge upon me, and my business was how to secure it. I had not a cave now to hide my money in, or a place where it might lie without lock or key, till it grew moldy and tarnished before anybody would meddle with it, on the contrary, I knew not where to put it, or whom to trust with it. My old patron, the captain, indeed, was honest, and that was the only refuge I had. In the next place, my interest in the Brazil seemed to summon me thither, but now I could not tell how to think of going thither till I had settled my affairs and left my effects in some safe hands behind me. At first I thought of my old friend the widow, who I knew was honest, and would be just to me, but then she was in years, and but poor, and, for aught I knew, might be in debt, so that, in a word, I had no way but to go back to England myself and take my effects with me. It was some months, however, before I resolved upon this, and, therefore, as I had rewarded the old captain fully, and to his satisfaction, who had been my former benefactor, so I began to think of the poor widow, whose husband had been my first benefactor, and she, while it was in her power, my faithful steward and instructor. So, the first thing I did, I got a merchant in Lisbon to write to his correspondent in London, not only to pay a bill, but to go find her out, and carry her, in money, a hundred pounds from me, and to talk with her, and comfort her in her poverty, by telling her she should, if I lived, have a further supply, at the same time I sent my two sisters in the country a hundred pounds each, they being, though not in want, yet not in very good circumstances, one having been married and left a widow, and the other having a husband not so kind to her as he should be. But among all my relations or acquaintances I could not yet pitch upon one to whom I durst commit the gross of my stock, that I might go away to the Brazils, and leave things safe behind me, and this greatly perplexed me. I had once a mind to have gone to the Brazils and have settled myself there. For I was, as it were, naturalist to the place, but I had some little scruple in my mind about religion, which insensibly drew me back. However, it was not religion that kept me from going there for the present, and as I had made no scruple of being openly of the religion of the country all the while I was among them, so neither did I yet, only that, now and then, having of late thought more of it than formerly, when I began to think of living and dying. Among them, I began to regret having professed myself a papist, and thought it might not be the best religion to die with. But, as I have said, this was not the main thing that kept me from going to the Brazils, but that really I did not know with whom to leave my effects behind me, so I resolved at last to go to England, where, if I arrived, I concluded that I should make some acquaintance, or find some relations, that would be faithful to me, and, accordingly, I prepared to go to England with all my wealth. In order to prepare things for my going home, I first, the Brazil fleet being just going away, resolved to give answers suitable to the just and faithful account of things I had from thence, and, first, to the prior of St. Augustine. I wrote a letter full of thanks for his just dealings, and the offer of the 872 moidores which were indisposed of, which I desired might be given, 500 to the monastery, and 372 to the poor, as the prior should direct, desiring the good. Padre's prayers for me, and the like. 
I wrote next a letter of thanks to my two trustees, with all the acknowledgement that so much justice and honesty called for, as for sending them any present, they were far above having any occasion of it. Lastly, I wrote to my partner, acknowledging his industry in the improving the plantation, and his integrity in increasing the stock of the works, giving him instructions for his future government of my part, according to the powers I had left with my old patron, to whom I desired him to send whatever became due to me, till he should hear from me more particularly, assuring him that it was my intention not only to come to him, but to settle myself there for the remainder of my life. To this I added a very handsome present of some Italian silks for his wife and two daughters, for such the captain's son informed me he had, with two pieces of fine English broadcloth, the best I could get in Lisbon, five pieces of black bays, and some Flanders lace of a good value. Having thus settled my affairs, sold my cargo, and turned all my effects into good bills of exchange, my next difficulty was which way to go to England, I had been accustomed enough to the sea, and yet I had a strange aversion to go to England by the sea at that time, and yet I could give no reason for it, yet the difficulty increased upon me so much, that though I had once shipped my baggage in order to go, yet I altered my mind, and that not once but two or three times. It is true I had been very unfortunate by sea, and this might be one of the reasons, but let no man slight the strong impulses of his own thoughts in cases of such moment, two of the ships which I had singled out to go in, I mean more particularly singled out than any other, having put my things on board one of them, and in the other having agreed with the captain, I say two of these ships. Miscarried. One was taken by the Algerines, and the other was lost on the start, near Torbay, and all the people drowned except three, so that in either of those vessels I had been made miserable. Having been thus harassed in my thoughts, my old pilot, to whom I communicated everything, pressed me earnestly not to go by sea, but either to go by land to the groin, and cross over the Bay of Biscay to Rochelle, from whence it was but an easy and safe journey by land to Paris, and so to Calais and Dover, or to go up to Madrid, and so all the way by land through France. In a word, I was so prepossessed against my going by sea at all, except from Calais to Dover, that I resolved to travel all the way by land, which, as I was not in haste, and did not value the charge, was by much the pleasanter way, and to make it more so, my old captain brought an English gentleman, the son of a merchant in Lisbon, who was willing to travel with me, after which we picked up two more English merchants also, and two young Portuguese gentlemen, the last going to Paris only, so that in all there were six of us and five servants, the two merchants and the two Portuguese, contenting themselves with one servant. Between two, to save the charge, and as for me, I got an English sailor to travel with me as a servant, besides my man Friday, who was too much a stranger to be capable of supplying the place of a servant on the road. In this manner I set out from Lisbon, and our company being very well mounted and armed, we made a little troop, whereof they did me the honor to call me captain, as well because I was the oldest man, as because I had two servants. And, indeed, was the origin of the whole journey. As I have troubled you with none of my sea journals, so I shall trouble you now. With none of my land journals, but some adventures that happened to us in this tedious and difficult journey I must not omit. When we came to Madrid, we, being all of us strangers to Spain, were willing to stay some time to see the court of Spain, and what was worth observing, but it being the latter part of the summer, we hastened away, and set out from Madrid. About the middle of October, but when we came to the edge of Navarre, we were 
alarmed, at several towns on the way, with an account that so much snow was falling on the French side of the mountains, that several travelers were obliged to come back to Pampeluna, after having attempted at an extreme hazard to pass on. When we came to Pampeluna itself, we found it so indeed, and to me, that had been always used to a hot climate, and to countries where I could scarce bear any clothes on, the cold was insufferable, nor, indeed, was it more painful than surprising to come but ten days before out of Old Castile, where the weather was not only warm but very hot, and immediately to feel a wind from the Pyrenean Mountains so very keen, so severely cold, as to be intolerable and to endanger benumbing and perishing of our fingers and toes. Poor Friday was really frightened when he saw the mountains all covered with snow, and felt cold weather, which he had never seen or felt before in his life. To mend the matter, when we came to Pampeluna it continued snowing with so much violence and so long, that the people said winter was come before its time, and the roads, which were difficult before, were now quite impassable. For, in a word, the snow lay in some places too thick for us to travel, and being not hard frozen, as is the case in the northern countries, there was no going without being in danger of being buried alive every step. We stayed no less than twenty days at Pampeluna, when, seeing the winter coming on, and no likelihood of its being better, for it was the severest winter all over Europe that had been known in the memory of man, I proposed that we should go away to Fontarabia, and there take shipping for Bordeaux, which was a very little voyage. But, while I was considering this, there came in four French gentlemen, who, having been stopped on the French side of the passes, as we were on the Spanish, had found out a guide, who, traversing the country near the head of Languedoc, had brought them over the mountains by such ways that they were not much incommoded with the snow, for where they met with snow in any quantity. They said it was frozen hard enough to bear them and their horses. We sent for this guide, who told us he would undertake to carry us the same way, with no hazard from the snow, provided we were armed sufficiently to protect ourselves from wild beasts, for, he said, in these great snows it was frequent for some wolves to show themselves at the foot of the mountains, being made ravenous for want of food, the ground being covered with snow. We told him we were well enough prepared for such creatures as they were, if he would ensure us from a kind of two-legged wolves, which we were told we were in most danger from, especially on the French side of the mountains. He satisfied us that there was no danger of that kind in the way that we were to go, so we readily agreed to follow him, as did also twelve other gentlemen with their servants, some French, some Spanish, who, as I said, had attempted to go, and were obliged to come back again. Accordingly, we set out from Pampeluna with our guide on the 15th of November. And indeed I was surprised when, instead of going forward, he came directly back with us on the same road that we came from Madrid, about twenty miles. When, having passed two rivers, and come into the plain country, we found ourselves in a warm climate again, where the country was pleasant, and no snow to be seen, but, on a sudden, turning to his left, he approached the mountains. Another way, and though it is true the hills and precipices looked dreadful. Yet he made so many tours, such meanders, and led us by such winding ways, that we insensibly passed the height of the mountains without being much encumbered with the snow, and all on a sudden he showed us the pleasant and fruitful provinces of Languedoc and Gascony, all green and flourishing, though at a great distance, and we had some rough way to pass still. We were a little uneasy, however, when we found it snowed one whole day and a night so fast that we could not travel, 
but he bid us be easy, we should soon be past it all, we found, indeed, that we began to descend every day, and to come more north than before, and so, depending upon our guide, we went on. It was about two hours before night when, our guide being something before us, and not just in sight, out rushed three monstrous wolves, and after them a bear, from a hollow way adjoining to a thick wood, two of the wolves made at the guide, and had he been far before us, he would have been devoured before we could have helped him, one of them fastened upon his horse, and the other attacked the man with such violence, that he had not time, or presence of mind enough, to draw his pistol, but hallooed and cried out to us most lustily. My man Friday being next me, I bade him ride up and see what was the matter. As soon as Friday came in sight of the man, he hallooed out as loud as the other. Oh master! Oh master, but like a bold fellow, rode directly up to the poor man, and with his pistol shot the wolf in the head that attacked him. It was happy for the poor man that it was my man Friday, for, having been used to such creatures in his country, he had no fear upon him, but went close up to him and shot him, whereas, any other of us would have fired at a farther distance, and have perhaps either missed the wolf or endangered shooting the man. But it was enough to have terrified a bolder man than I, and, indeed, it alarmed all our company, when, with the noise of Friday's pistol, we heard on both sides the most dismal howling of wolves, and the noise, redoubled by the echo of the mountains, appeared to us as if there had been a prodigious number of them, and perhaps there was not such a few as that we had no cause of apprehension, however, as Friday had killed this wolf, the other that had fastened upon the horse left him immediately, and fled, without doing him any damage, having happily fastened upon his head, where the bosses of the bridle had stuck in his teeth. But the man was most hurt, for the raging creature had bit him twice, once in the arm, and the other time a little above his knee, and though he had made some defense, he was just tumbling down by the disorder of his horse, when Friday came up and shot the wolf. It is easy to suppose that at the noise of Friday's pistol we all mended our pace, and rode up as fast as the way, which was very difficult, would give us leave, to see what was the matter. As soon as we came clear of the trees, which blinded us before, we saw clearly what had been the case, and how Friday had disengaged the poor guide, though we did not presently discern what kind of creature it was he had killed. Chapter XX Fight between Friday and a bear But never was a fight managed so heartily, and in such a surprising manner as that which followed between Friday and the bear, which gave us all, though at first we were surprised and afraid for him, the greatest diversion imaginable. As the bear is a heavy, clumsy creature, and does not gallop as the wolf does, who is swift and light, so he has two particular qualities, which generally are the rule of his actions, first, as to men, who are not his proper prey, he does not usually attempt them, except they first attack him, unless he be excessively hungry, which it is probable might now be the case, the ground being covered with snow, if you do not meddle with him, he will not meddle with you, but then you must take care to be very civil to him, and give him the road, for he is a very nice gentleman, he will not go a step out of his way for a prince, nay, if you are really afraid, your best way is to look another way, and keep going on, for sometimes if you stop, and stand still, and look steadfastly at him, he takes it for an affront, but if you throw or toss anything at him, though it were but a bit of stick as big as your finger, he thinks himself abused, and sets all other business aside to pursue his revenge. 
and will have satisfaction in point of honor that is his first quality. The next is, if he be once affronted, he will never leave you, night or day. Till he has his revenge, but follows at a good round rate till he overtakes. You. My man Friday had delivered our guide, and when we came up to him he was. Helping him off his horse, for the man was both hurt and frightened, when on a. Sudden we espied the bear come out of the wood, and a monstrous one it was, the. Biggest by far that ever I saw. We were all a little surprised when we saw him. But when Friday saw him, it was easy to see joy and courage in the. Fellow's countenance. Oh. Oh. Oh, says Friday, three times. Pointing to him, oh master, you give me te leave, me shaky te hand with him, me makey you good laugh. I was surprised to see the fellow so well pleased. You fool, says. I, he will eat you up. Et me up, et me. Up, says Friday, twice over again, me et him up, me makey you. Good laugh, you all stay here me show you good laugh. So down he sits. And gets off his boots in a moment, and puts on a pair of pumps, as we call the flat shoes they wear, and which he had in his pocket, gives my other servant. His horse, and with his gun away he flew, swift like the wind. The bear was walking softly on, and offered to meddle with nobody, till Friday. Coming pretty near, calls to him, as if the bear could understand him. Hark ye, yeah, hark ye, yeah, says Friday, me speaky with you. We followed at a distance, for now being down on the Gascony side of the mountains, we were entered a vast forest, where the country was plain and pretty open, though it had many trees in it scattered here and there. Friday, who had, as we say, the heels of the bear, came up with him quickly, and took up a great stone, and threw it at him, and hit him just on the head, but did him no more harm than if he had thrown it against a wall, but it answered. Friday's end, for the rogue was so void of fear that he did it purely to make the bear follow him, and show us some laugh as he called it. As soon as the bear felt the blow, and saw him, he turns about and comes after him, taking very long strides, and shuffling on at a strange rate, so as would have put a horse to a middling gallop, away runs Friday, and takes his course as if he ran towards us for help, so we all resolved to fire at once upon the bear, and deliver my man, though I was angry at him for bringing the bear back upon us. When he was going about his own business another way, and especially I was angry that he had turned the bear upon us, and then ran away, and I called out. You dog, is this your making us laugh? Come away, and take your horse. That we may shoot the creature. He heard me, and cried out, no. Shoot, no shoot, stand still, and you get much laugh and as the nimble. Creature ran two feet for the bear's one, he turned on a sudden on one. Side of us, and seeing a great oak tree fit for his purpose, he beckoned to us. To follow, and doubling his pace, he got nimbly up the tree, laying his gun. Down upon the ground, at about five or six yards from the bottom of the tree. The bear soon came to the tree, and we followed at a distance, the first thing. He did he stopped at the gun, smelt at it, but let it lie, and up he scrambles. Into the tree, climbing like a cat, though so monstrous heavy. I was amazed at the folly, as I thought it, of my man, and could not for my life see anything to laugh at, till seeing the bear get up the tree, we all rode near to him. When we came to the tree, there was Friday got out to the small end of a large branch, and the bear got about halfway to him. As soon as the bear got out to that part where the limb of the tree was weaker, ha, says he to us, now you see me teach ye the bear dance so he began jumping and shaking the bell, at which the bear began to totter, but stood still, and 
began to look behind him, to see how he should get back, then, indeed, we did. Laugh heartily. But Friday had not done with him by a great deal, when seeing him stand still, he called out to him again, as if he had supposed the bear could speak English, what, you come no farther, pray you come farther, so he left jumping and shaking the tree, and the bear, just as if he understood what he said, did come a little farther, then he began jumping again, and the bear stopped again. We thought now was a good time to knock him in the head, and called to Friday to stand still and we should shoot the bear. But he cried out earnestly, Oh, pray. Oh, pray. No shoot, me shoot by. And then he would have said by and by. However, to shorten the story. Friday danced so much, and the bear stood so ticklish, that we had laughing. Enough, but still could not imagine what the fellow would do, for first we thought he depended upon shaking the bear off, and we found the bear was too cunning for that too, for he would not go out far enough to be thrown down, but clung fast with his great broad claws and feet, so that we could not imagine what would be the end of it, and what the jest would be at last. But Friday put us out of doubt quickly, for seeing the bear cling fast to the bell, and that he would not be persuaded to come any farther, well, well, says. Friday, you know come farther, me go, you know come to me, me come to you, and upon this he went out to the smaller end, where it would bend with his weight, and gently let himself down by it, sliding down the bow till. He came near enough to jump down on his feet, and away he ran to his gun, took it up, and stood still. Well, said I to him, Friday, what? Will you do now? Why don't you shoot him? No shoot. Says Friday, no yet, me shoot now, me no kill, me stay, give you one. More laugh and, indeed, so he did, for when the bear saw his enemy. Gone, he came back from the bell, where he stood, but did it very cautiously looking behind him every step, and coming backward till he got into the body of the tree, then, with the same hinder end foremost, he came down the tree, grasping it with his claws, and moving one foot at a time, very leisurely. At this juncture, and just before he could set his hind foot on the ground, Friday stepped up close to him, clapped the muzzle of his piece into his ear, and shot him dead. Then the rogue turned about to see if we did not laugh, and when he saw we were pleased by our looks, he began to laugh very loud. So we kill bear in my country, says Friday. So you kill them? Says I, why, you have no guns? No, says he. No gun, but shoot great much long arrow. This was a good diversion to us, but we were still in a wild place, and our guide very much hurt, and what to do we hardly knew, the howling of wolves ran much in my head. And, indeed, except the noise I once heard on the shore of Africa, of which I have said something already, I never heard anything that filled me with so much horror. These things, and the approach of night, called us off, or else, as Friday would have had us, we should certainly have taken the skin of this monstrous creature off, which was worth saving, but we had near three leagues to go, and our guide hastened us, so we left him, and went forward on our journey. The ground was still covered with snow, though not so deep and dangerous as on the mountains, and the ravenous creatures, as we heard afterwards, were come down into the forest and plain country, pressed by hunger, to seek for food, and had done a great deal of mischief in the villages, where they surprised the country people, killed a great many of their sheep and horses, and some people, too. We had one dangerous place to pass, and our guide told us if there were more wolves in the country we should find them there, 
and this was a small plain. Surrounded with woods on every side, and a long, narrow defile, or lane, which we were to pass to get through the wood, and then we should come to the village, where we were to lodge. It was within half an hour of sunset when we entered the wood, and a little. After sunset when we came into the plain, we met with nothing in the first wood, except that in a little plain within the wood, which was not above two furlongs over, we saw five great wolves cross the road, full speed, one after another, as if they had been in chase of some prey, and had it in view, they took no notice of us, and were gone out of sight in a few moments. Upon this, our guide, who, by the way, was but a faint-hearted fellow, bid us keep in a ready posture, for he believed there were more wolves a coming. We kept our arms ready, and our eyes about us, but we saw no more wolves till we came through that wood, which was near half a league, and entered the plain. As soon as we came into the plain, we had occasion enough to look about us. The first object we met with was a dead horse, that is to say, a poor horse which the wolves had killed, and at least a dozen of them at work, we could not say. Eating him, but picking his bones rather, for they had eaten up all the flesh. Before. We did not think fit to disturb them at their feast, neither did they. Take much notice of us. Friday would have let fly at them, but I would not. Suffer him by any means, for I found we were like to have more business upon. Our hands than we were aware of. We had not gone half over the plain when we began to hear the wolves howl in the wood on our left in a frightful manner. And presently after we saw about a hundred coming on directly towards us, all in a body, and most of them in a line, as regularly as an army drawn up by experienced officers. I scarce knew in what manner to receive them, but found to draw ourselves in a close line was the only way, so we formed in a moment. But that we might not have too much interval, I ordered that only every other man should fire, and that the others, who had not fired, should stand ready to give them a second volley immediately, if they continued to advance upon us. And then that those that had fired at first should not pretend to load their fuses again, but stand ready, every one with a pistol, for we were all armed with a fusee and a pair of pistols each man, so we were, by this method, able to fire six volleys, half of us at a time, however, at present we had no necessity, for upon firing the first volley, the enemy made a full stop, being terrified as well with the noise as with the fire. Four of them being shot in the head, dropped, several others were wounded, and went bleeding off, as we could see by the snow. I found they stopped, but did not immediately retreat. Whereupon, remembering that I had been told that the fiercest creatures were terrified at the voice of a man, I caused all the company to halloo as loud as they could, and I found the notion not altogether mistaken, for upon our shout, they began to retire and turn about. I then ordered a second volley to be fired in their rear, which put them to the gallop, and away they went to the woods. This gave us leisure to charge our pieces again, and that we might lose no time, we kept going, but we had but little more than loaded our fuses, and put ourselves in readiness, when we heard a terrible noise in the same wood on our left, only that it was farther onward, the same way we were to go. The night was coming on, and the light began to be dusky, which made it worse. On our side, but the noise increasing, we could easily perceive that it was the howling and yelling of those hellish creatures, and on a sudden we perceived three troops of wolves, one on our left, one behind us, and one in our front. So that we seemed to be surrounded with them, however, as they did not fall. Upon us, we kept our way forward, as fast as we could make our horses go. Which, the way being very rough, was only a good hard trot. 
In this manner, we came in view of the entrance of a wood, through which we were to pass, at the farther side of the plain, but we were greatly surprised, when coming nearer the lane or pass, we saw a confused number of wolves standing just at the entrance. On a sudden, at another opening of the wood, we heard the noise of a gun, and looking that way, out rushed a horse, with a saddle and a bridle on him, flying like the wind, and sixteen or seventeen wolves after him, full speed, the horse had the advantage of them, but as we supposed that he could not hold it at that rate, we doubted not but they would get up with him at last, no question but they did. But here we had a most horrible sight, for riding up to the entrance where the horse came out, we found the carcasses of another horse and of two men, devoured by the ravenous creatures, and one of the men was no doubt the same, whom we heard fire the gun, for there lay a gun just by him fired off, but as to the man, his head, and the upper part of his body was eaten up. This filled us with horror, and we knew not what course to take, but the creatures resolved us soon, for they gathered about us presently, in hopes of prey, and I verily believe there were three hundred of them. It happened, very much to our advantage, that at the entrance into the wood, but a little way from it, there lay some large timber trees, which had been cut down the summer before, and I suppose lay there for carriage. I drew my little troop in among those trees, and placing ourselves in a line behind one long tree, I advised them all to alight, and keeping that tree before us for a brayest work, to stand in a triangle, or three fronts, enclosing our horses in the center. We did so, and it was well we did, for never was a more furious charge than the creatures made upon us in this place. They came on with a growling kind of noise, and mounted the piece of timber, which, as I said, was our brayest work, as if they were only rushing upon their prey, and this fury of theirs, it seems, was principally occasioned by their seeing our horses behind us. I ordered our men to fire as before, every other man, and they took their aim so sure that they killed several of the wolves at the first volley, but there was a necessity to keep a continual firing, for they came on like devils, those behind pushing on those before. When we had fired a second volley of our fuses, we thought they stopped a little, and I hoped they would have gone off, but it was but a moment, for others came forward again, so we fired two volleys of our pistols, and I believe in these four firings we had killed seventeen or eighteen of them, and lamed twice as many, yet they came on again. I was loath to spend our shot too hastily, so I called my servant, not my man Friday, for he was better employed. For, with the greatest dexterity imaginable, he had charged my fusee and his own while we were engaged but, as I said, I called my other man, and, giving him a horn of powder, I had him lay a train all along the piece of timber, and let it be a large train. He did so, and had but just time to get away, when the wolves came up to it, and some got upon it, when I, snapping an unchanged arg pistol close to the powder, set it on fire, those that were upon the timber were scorched with it, and six or seven of them fell, or rather jumped. In among us with the force and fright of the fire, we dispatched these in an instant, and the rest were so frightened with the light, which the night for it was now very near dark made more terrible that they drew back a little, upon which I ordered our last pistols to be fired off in one volley, and after that we gave a shout, upon this the wolves turned tail and we sallied immediately upon near twenty lame ones that we found struggling on the ground, and fell to cutting them with our swords, which answered our expectation, for the crying and howling they made was better understood by their fellows, so that they all fled and left us. 
We had, first and last, killed about three score of them, and had it been. Daylight we had killed many more. The field of battle being thus cleared, we made forward again, for we had still near a league to go. We heard the ravenous creatures howl and yell in the woods as we went several times, and sometimes we fancied we saw some of them, but the snow dazzling our eyes, we were not certain. In about an hour more we came to the town where we were to lodge, which we found in a terrible fright and all in arms, for, it seems, the night before the wolves and some bears had broken into the village, and put them in such terror that they were obliged to keep guard night and day, but especially in the night, to preserve their cattle, and indeed their people. The next morning our guide was so ill, and his limbs swelled so much with the rankling of his two wounds, that he could go no farther, so we were obliged to take a new guide here, and go to Toulouse, where we found a warm climate, a fruitful, pleasant country, and no snow, no wolves, nor anything like them, but when we told our story at Toulouse, they told us it was nothing but what was ordinary in the great forest at the foot of the mountains, especially when the snow lay on the ground, but they inquired much what kind of guide we had got. Who would venture to bring us that way in such a severe season, and told us it was surprising we were not all devoured. When we told them how we placed ourselves and the horses in the middle, they blamed us exceedingly, and told us it was fifty to one but we had been all destroyed, for it was the sight of the horses which made the wolves so furious, seeing their prey, and that at other times they are really afraid of a gun, but being excessively hungry, and raging. On that account, the eagerness to come at the horses had made them senseless of danger, and that if we had not by the continual fire, and at last by the stratagem of the train of powder, mastered them, it had been great odds but that we had been torn to pieces, whereas, had we been content to have sat still on horseback, and fired as horsemen, they would not have taken the horses so much for their own, when men were on their backs, as otherwise, and withal. They told us that at last, if we had stood all together, and left our horses, they would have been so eager to have devoured them, that we might have come off safe, especially having our firearms in our hands, being so many in number. For my part, I was never so sensible of danger in my life, for, seeing above, three hundred devils come roaring and open mouthed to devour us, and having nothing to shelter us or retreat to, I gave myself over for lost, and, as it was, I believe I shall never care to cross those mountains again, I think I would much rather go a thousand leagues by sea, though I was sure to meet with a storm once a week. I have nothing uncommon to take notice of in my passage through France nothing but what other travelers have given an account of with much more advantage than I can. I traveled from Toulouse to Paris, and without any considerable stay came to Calais, and landed safe at Dover the 14th of January, after having had a severe cold season to travel in. I was now come to the center of my travels, and had in a little time all my new discovered estate safe about me, the bills of exchange which I brought with me having been currently paid. My principal guide and privy counselor was my good ancient widow, who, in gratitude for the money I had sent her, thought no pains too much nor care too great to employ for me, and I trusted her so entirely that I was perfectly easy as to the security of my effects, and, indeed, I was very happy from the beginning, and now to the end, in the unspotted integrity of this good gentlewoman. And now, having resolved to dispose of my plantation in the Brazils, I wrote to my old friend at Lisbon, who, having offered it to the two merchants, the survivors of my trustees, who lived in the Brazils, they accepted the offer. 
and remitted 33,000 pieces of aid to a correspondent of theirs. At Lisbon to pay for it. In return, I signed the instrument of sale in the form which they sent from Lisbon, and sent it to my old man, who sent me the bills of exchange for 32,800 pieces of aid for the estate, reserving the payment of 100 moidores a year to him, the old man, during his life, and 50 moidores afterwards to his son for his life, which I had promised them, and which the plantation was to make good as a rent charge. And thus I have given the first part of a life of fortune and adventure a life of providence's checker work, and of a variety which the world will seldom be able to show the like of, beginning foolishly, but closing much more happily than any part of it ever gave me leave so much as to hope for. Anyone would think that in this state of complicated good fortune I was past running any more hazards and so, indeed, I had been, if other circumstances had concurred, but I was inured to a wandering life, had no family, nor many relations, nor, however rich, had I contracted fresh acquaintance, and though I had sold my estate in the Brazils, yet I could not keep that country out of my head, and had a great mind to be upon the wing. Again, especially I could not resist the strong inclination I had to see my island, and to know if the poor Spaniards were in being there. My true friend, the widow, earnestly dissuaded me from it, and so far prevailed with me, that for almost seven years she prevented my running abroad, during which time I took my two nephews, the children of one of my brothers, into my care, the eldest, having something of his own, I bred up as a gentleman, and gave him a settlement of some addition to his estate after my decease. The other I placed with the captain of a ship, and after five years, finding him a sensible, bold, enterprising young fellow, I put him into a good ship, and sent him to sea, and this young fellow afterwards drew me in, as old as I was, to further adventures. Myself. In the meantime, I in part settled myself here, for, first of all, I married. And that not either to my disadvantage or dissatisfaction, and had three children, two sons, and one daughter, but my wife dying, and my nephew coming home with good success from a voyage to Spain, my inclination to go abroad, and his importunity, prevailed, and engaged me to go in his ship as a private trader to the East Indies, this was in the year 1694. In this voyage I visited my new colony in the island, saw my successors the Spaniards, had the old story of their lives and of the villains I left there. How at first they insulted the poor Spaniards, how they afterwards agreed, disagreed, united, separated, and how at last the Spaniards were obliged to use violence with them, how they were subjected to the Spaniards, how honestly the Spaniards used them a history, if it were entered into, as full of variety and wonderful accidents as my own part particularly, also, as to their battles with the Caribbeans, who landed several times upon the island, and as to the improvement they made upon the island itself, and how five of them made an attempt upon the mainland, and brought away eleven men and five women prisoners, by which, at my coming, I found about twenty young children on the island. Here I stayed about twenty days, left them supplies of all necessary things, and particularly of arms, powder, shot, clothes, tools, and two workmen, which I had brought from England with me, viz. a carpenter and a smith. Besides this, I shared the lands into parts with them, reserved to myself the property of the whole, but gave them such parts respectively as they agreed on. And having settled all things with them, and engaged them not to leave the place, I left them there. From thence I touched at the Brazils, from whence I sent a bark, which I bought there, with more people to the island, and in it, 
besides other supplies, I sent seven women, being such as I found proper for service, or for wives too, such as would take them. As to the Englishmen, I promised to send them some women from England, with a good cargo of necessaries, if they would apply themselves to planting which I afterwards could not perform. The fellows proved very honest and diligent after they were mastered and had their properties set apart for them. I sent them, also, from the Brazils, five cows. Three of them being big with calf, some sheep, and some hogs, which when I came again were considerably increased. But all these things, with an account how three hundred Caribbees came and invaded them, and ruined their plantations, and how they fought with that whole number twice, and were at first defeated, and one of them killed, but at last, a storm destroying their enemies' canoes, they famished or destroyed almost all the rest, and renewed and recovered the possession of their plantation, and still lived upon the island. All these things, with some very surprising incidents in some new adventures of my own, for ten years more, I shall give a farther account of in the second part of my story. End of the Project Gutenberg ebook The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe Updated editions will replace the previous one The old editions will be renamed Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright Law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works So the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright Royalties Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works to protect the Project Gutenberg Trademark Concept and Trademark Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose, such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start full license. The full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work. To protect the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark. Electronic Works. 1.a. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg Trademark. Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property trademark slash copyright agreement if you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of project gutenberg trademark electronic works in your possession if you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work and you do not agree to be bound. By the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be 
used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. C. Paragraph 1.C below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. See paragraph 1.E below. 1.C. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or PGLOF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark license when you share it without charge with others. 1.D. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this. Agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.E Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg. 1.E.1 the following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied, or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.E.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.E.1 through 1.E.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark. Trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.E.8 or 1.E.9. 1.E.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution 
must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 Do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the project. Gutenberg trademark license. 1.e.6. You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark website www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee, or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plane. Vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying, or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty. Payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the project. Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in. Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg. Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies. You in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work, you comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark works. 1.e.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work or group of works on different terms then are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg Trademark Trademark 
contact the foundation as said. Fourth in section 3 below. 1.f 1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread. Works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the project. Gutenberg Trademark Collection Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate, or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright, or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty, Disclaimer of Damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the project. Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the project. Gutenberg Trademark Trademark, and any other party distributing a project. Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs, and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or Incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you Receive the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium. With your written explanation, the person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you receive the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing. Without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth. In paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express, or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or Limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent, or employee of the foundation, anyone. Providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion, and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs, and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur, a. distribution of this, or any Project Gutenberg trademark work, b alteration, 
modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark work, and c. any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg trademark. Project Gutenberg trademark is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged, and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark S. Goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark Collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg Trademark and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501 C. 3. Educational Corporation organized under the laws of the State of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The Foundation's IN or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West. Salt Lake City, Utah, 84116801-596-1887. Email contact links and up. To date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website. And official page at www.gutenberg.org slash contact. Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up. With these requirements, we do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance to send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state. Visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org donate. Section 5. 
general information about Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the project. Gutenberg trademark concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper. Edition Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Contents Chapter I Start in Life. Chapter 2 Slavery and Escape. Chapter 3 Wrecked on a Desert Island. Chapter 4 First Weeks on the Island. Chapter V Builds a House The Journal Chapter 6 Ill and Conscience Stricken Chapter 7 Agricultural Experience Chapter 8 Surveys His Position Chapter 9 A Boat Chapter X Tames Goats Chapter 11 Finds Print of Man's Foot on the Sand Chapter 12 A Cave Retreat Chapter 13 Wreck of a Spanish Ship Chapter 14 A Dream Realized Chapter 15 Friday's Education Chapter 16 Rescue of Prisoners from Cannibals Chapter 17 Visit of Mutineers Chapter 18 The Ship Recovered Chapter 19 Return to England Chapter XX Fight Between Friday and a Bear The Full Project Gutenberg License